shoulder pain and shoulder complaints affect a lot of people. It's not quite the number one and number two complaints of low back pain and neck pain, but it's up there. And unfortunately, I don't think as a musculoskeletal or orthopedic community, we're doing a good job of really helping people with these complaints. Shoulder pain often recurs and people often have pain that goes unresolved. One big factor I believe for this is the test that we rely on to diagnose or deduce what's actually causing the problem. Now, historically, what I learned in my doctoral program and what people continue to learn, although it's losing a little bit of favor, is myriad special tests for the shoulder, which are called OSTs or orthopedic special tests. Now we have these orthopedic special tests that we do in the clinic for every body part and every kind of pathology that you can think of. And they are typically used in conjunction with imaging to arrive at a diagnosis. Now, if you followed anything that I've been talking about for years, you know how fraught imaging is with problems, but special tests in my mind are also quite invalid and unreliable. So there are over about 70 orthopedic special tests for the shoulder. Have I still have them? Do I still have them all committed to memory? Absolutely not. I look them up if I need them, but the amount of times that I need to use these orthopedic special tests for the shoulder are few and far between. Now, what do these shoulder tests test? Anatomy, structures. They allege that they can deduce what structure is broken or not working well by doing uh, specific maneuvers with specific pressure. So for example, the near impingement test up above the head, um, Hawkins-Kennedy test, speeds tests. We also have the full can test and the empty can test. Now a paper from I think 2020 titled something like, is it time to put rotator cuff special tests out to pasture? And the author's editorial conclusion was yes. And I would emphasize that yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, they don't give recommendations that really offer something to clinicians or patients to replace what clinicians are using to make their diagnostic decisions. So they point out that these tests are not valid, meaning we can say that, oh, this test is supraspinatus when you push down on it and it creates the patient's concomitant pain with weakness. But in fact, eight or nine muscles are stressed during that test. And I would go a step further and add lots of things are stressed, not just muscles. The integrity of the shoulder joint complex is stressed as well as the integrity of the neck and thoracic joints. So I wish the authors could go a step further in this paper and offer to the readers, in lieu of using these tests that we know are not testing the anatomy perfectly and giving us the answers we need for diagnosis, which is manifested in poor outcomes with clinical care that are based on those diagnoses, in lieu of them, we can use repeated movement testing. Repeated movement testing has been around for several decades, proposed by Robin McKenzie. I assumed its use in 2016 when I started taking Robin McKenzie's MDT courses and learning about this test. And I was baffled that we weren't learning this in school. So another paper earlier in about 2017 by Abadie et al, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, looked at if we use these special tests for the shoulder, do they change if we restore the joint mechanics to the shoulder or restore joint mechanics to the neck? And the answer is yes, these tests are inconsistent. Meaning if you push down on someone's arm and you say, oh, it's rotator cuff, it's the supraspinatus, one of the four tendons of the rotator cuff that's uh, either torn or there's a tendinopathy, tendinopathy in that muscle's tendon. If you find that that's a positive test and then using the MDT repeated movement testing, you find that actually the patient's problem is the shoulder joint is not mechanically moving well and you restore that joint to its proper mechanics using directional preference and you retest that test, is it still positive? And they found that no, it's not consistently positive. So using repeated movement testing is testing physiology, right? These special tests are by and large testing the structural competence of anatomy or structure. And does anatomy sometimes fail? Absolutely. People fall on their shoulders and rip ligaments off bones. They fracture the humerus. They 
um, severely tear the tendon. These things happen. And in the clinical picture, we're hearing from most of these people that there was some sort of trauma. So in the absence of trauma especially, but also in the presence of trauma, we need to consider physiology. And I don't think I got a good handle on physiological problems in my doctoral program. I think anatomy is push, 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 pushed. And I think we're starting to find and people are starting to wake up if clinicians are curious why their outcomes aren't wonderful or why the patient, go, the pain goes away, but then it comes back. They're starting to understand that physiology plays a role. We do not have a great explanation for why I can have a patient with a positive special test of the shoulder, um, weakness, pain, functional deficits, and I can have them repeatedly move their shoulder into functional internal rotation for three days and everything gets better. There are some ideas, and including debris being moved out of the way in the joint, such as a fat pad or a small piece of cartilage or a small piece of bone. These are theoretical at the moment, but it's a cause and effect type of testing that you can see in front of you. You can see it in the clinic and the patient can see it at home. When I do this motion, all my impairments get better and my pain gets better. And that example would have a directional preference of internal rotation. So I propose to people, I encourage people to start thinking that musculoskeletal care is not just anatomy or structures. We know from test after test after test that if we take pictures, sophisticated pictures from 2023 of people's rotator cuff tendons, ligaments, knee cartilage, you name it, there are going to be flaws in these structures. And sometimes they're relevant to the patient's pain and sometimes they're just the accumulated dings over a lifetime that have no relevance to the patient's complaint and why that patient presents to the clinician's office. Uh, an analogy would be something like this. Do people's pancreas have a failure of creating insulin sensitivity and insulin regulation of blood glucose because someone has a gunshot through their pancreas that's creating a structural incompetence? No. By and large, most times we have these blood glucose and insulin problems because of the function, the physiology of the pancreas is not working as intended. And we can go further back and look at why that occurs with people. But physiology and anatomy are the two big groups of understanding the health of a system and a human body. And I think we're putting way too much emphasis on anatomy and people are not, or clinicians are not equipped to really test physiology. So I encourage all clinicians, if they have the bandwidth and the time and the energy and the money to buy Robin McKenzie's books, learn his methodology. I think it should be taught in school. Unfortunately, it's not. We're still teaching these outdated tests, which I don't think are doing patients any favors. And patients, if you're struggling with shoulder pain, treat your own neck and treat your own shoulder are, again, inexpensive books you can buy online. You can probably find them used for only a few dollars. If you have the self-starterness to read a book and self-assess and see if you can self-treat, those can be very, very helpful. But repeated movement testing is my go-to to test the physiology of a system. Let's find out if the shoulder complaint is coming from anatomy, yes, but let's also find out if it's coming from a physiological problem. Maybe the joint's just mechanically not moving well in the shoulder. Maybe something's a little stiff and tweaked in the neck or the mid-back. I would say that over 60 to 70% of patients with shoulder complaints that I see have a physiological mechanical problem. Structures are competent. Structures are intact enough to do what they need to do. It's just not functioning well. And for the other things, we're getting the frozen shoulders and the true tears and things like that. But anatomy needs to be coupled with physiology when we start to address what is causing someone's problem.